Canada just recorded the highest amount of homes sold in any year ever. Hello and welcome back to the Vancouver Life Real Estate Podcast and YouTube channel. Myself and Ryan Dash from EXP are here today and we are talking about national home sales prices and mortgages and of course what this all means if it's all coming to a head and what is going to happen next. So as I mentioned off the top here, year to date, we have seen the most amount of homes sold in Canada ever recorded. And there's still just over one month of sales left to happen. So we are sitting right now at about 590,000 homes sold in the year 2021 so far. Uh, clearly, that's going to cross the $600,000 mark or sorry, 600,000 unit. unit mark. And uh, and basically every home moving forward is a new record all time high sales volume number. Uh, not too surprising. I mean, every month, every week we come on here and we're talking about new records, new height, all times across the board. And this, this, this episode is no different. Uh, I was going to say, didn't, didn't we just talk about this? Yeah, <laughs> I feel, yeah it, it almost feels like a broken record kind of thing, but the data is what the data is. We're here to share it, to analyze it and to project what's happening next. Um, so part of the question, why, why are sales continuing to push up and up and up and part of what's doing that part of what's pushing sort of the the last group of people into the market that haven't bought in the last 18 months or so is largely due to the threat of rising interest rates because for people that have been thinking about getting in and they're not and they're hearing that it's going to be more expensive likely very soon we're already seeing it in the uh, fixed rates and variable rates are still rock bottom so they're like well let's jump in and get this because we know it is more than likely that at some point in the next year that rates are going to go up and thereby diminishing their buying power. So we're seeing a bunch of that happening right now. Um, nationally, home sales jumped 8.6% last month. <laughs> That's the largest incremental rate we've seen since the pandemic began. And we've had an insane 18 months, and yet that's the new record last month. So things in some areas are resurging. There was a bit of a dip a couple months ago as far as sales volumes goes, and now we have a new record for the last 18 months anyway, of sales volumes nationally. Yeah, and I tend to agree. I mean, I, I think for the last probably three, four months on the show, we've been saying how the, the last push in this sort of environment is gonna come uh, within the last sort of six months of when we think the bank is going to start raising rates. Um, and lo and behold, I believe that uh, that narrative is, is playing out now. It started to play out, right? November uh, typically uh, and historically is a much slower month comparatively to the rest of the year. Um, but what are trends these days? <laughs> um, that that I say that jokingly, but um, you know this cycle is kind of unlike any other that we've been through in in kind of modern history. So um, you know it's it's very interesting to see um, November as being you know. <laughs> the largest increase in volume since the pandemic began. Um, so, I mean, you know, to give you a little bit more in terms of stats here, um, you know, new listings lifted by 3.2% in October, but remained at 5% below the 10 year averages. Um, that's kind of the broken record story. Uh, active listings dropped another 4.4%. We are now only at 100,000 active listings across Canada. Folks, in 2015, it was 250,000. That's, <laughs> since 2019, that's a decline of 50% and 60% since that 2015 stat. I, I mean, like a, that's a serious issue. That's a serious issue. And um, it's funny, we're going to talk about it a little bit later in the, um, in the pod, but we, we were, we've read some articles recently about how the Bank of Canada has come out and said, ah, oh, you know, well, investors are to blame. They're the ones who've been buying up and driving up the prices everywhere by accumulating more property. And it has nothing to do with the fact that we have nothing to buy or monetary policy or anything like that. But we'll get into that a little bit later because they've told us to go and do that. <laughs> Which is interesting. Anyhow, 
Um, Ontario saw a 43% drop in inventory year over year. That is tremendous. And BC was second worse um, <laughs> at 38.4%, right? Um, across Canada, there is now less than two months of active inventory. It has been a steady decline. Like if you look at the chart of that national home active listings number that Ryan just said, I mean, you literally look at it from 2016 and it's just straight down. Like there's no lull. And, and again, so yes, as extreme as this pandemic and QE and monetary policies have been for the last year and a half, the depleting inventory was an issue starting with going back rather about four years. Like, it, mm -hmm. you know, once it started to decline 16, 17, 18, I mean, it was an issue in 18, but yeah. now it's just on overdrive. But anyway. Well, we, and we haven't seen it kind of correct. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen any inclination that we're, we're going to plateau or that we're going to slow, right? Like it's, it's just constantly been hacked at, right? And there's been no new inventory that's come back and really helped to, to sort of stave that off. And it doesn't appear like it's going to happen either. No, we'd have to triple the active inventory that we have on market today by tomorrow to just enter into that balanced market. Yeah, it's not going to happen for years. So understandably, when you have rapidly depleting inventory and you've got record high sales, um, prices are going up. Nationally, we saw a 2.7% increase just last month, uh, and we are up about 24% from this time last year. So. Wow. In Canada, we are at a new all-time high in average sale price of $770,000. And with that 24% we we're just talking about, the average home is up $147,000 from this time last year. God, man. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, we've probably if all heard about... If you don't own a home, like, how do you, how do you keep pace? Yeah, how hard is it to save $147,000 a year just to maintain the same amount of equity you'd have if you were a homeowner? And that's after tax. That's after tax money, if that's your primary residence, mm -hmm. right? That's a tremendous amount of money. Anyways. So you've likely heard about some extreme stories about a lot of the rural areas that have had these, you know, obscene price increases. And um, for example, we look to Ontario where 11 of their smaller regions have price increases in excess of 60, 60 percent in the last 24 months. Um, oh. That is led by an area called Bancroft, which is up 76.2 percent in the last two years. <laughs> like it's just obscene. Now, again, that's a big pendulum swing, obviously, on the way up. Those smaller rural areas that saw the biggest jumps, I will say, are the most susceptible to that pendulum swinging the other way. I was just going to say, you know, in any marketplace, whenever you get excessive exuberance, you get excessive despair, right? So, um, and when you, I would call that unsustainable growth, right? So, you know, in two years, when you're seeing spikes at that level, there's a good chance, like Dan just said, it's going to swing back, right? To what degree? I don't know. But um, is it likely you're going to see all of that, that gain gone? No right? Inventory levels would suggest otherwise, but you know, can it, can it correct? Absolutely. So be very careful with that. Mm -hmm. I think to a, a bit of an indicator as to maybe that rush coming back from rural areas into, you know, the city areas, uh, last month, Toronto, like the downtown core of Toronto saw a 4.8% increase last month. <laughs> that tells, that speaks to where the demand is. I mean, that's almost 5% in a month. Wasn't now, it close to that last month, Dan? I'm pretty sure it was very similar. Well, and there's, now we have sustained growth. So yeah. now we have a real indicator of where people are going now. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we've been talking all-time highs. We've been talking record numbers for, you know, inwards of a year plus here. And it does feel more and more like we're getting to the end of this cycle. It's been so extreme. It's been so hot for so long that things are likely to change soon. They just have to, right? You can't have this level of 24% year over year price increases go for years on end. It's just, it yeah. can't happen. It's impossible. So we want to kind of dig into a bit of the risk factors that are starting to surface right now and, and for what to kind of look out for and, and prepare yourself for. Because while we don't know the future, we do know that real estate cycles happen. Nothing goes up forever. Nothing goes down forever. So 
we're at a, what feels like the tail end of this hyper bull run. And uh, let's get into exploring some of the things that uh, we should be expecting moving forward as far as the risks go. So first off, just one thing to note, Toronto and Vancouver are two major cities in this country. Um, they're actually responsible for about 40% of the sales volumes, dollar figure here, for all the homes sold in Canada. So obviously the vast majority is happening there. And is that so much of a risk? Yeah, maybe, but it, it also goes to show how much room there is outside of those areas and where people, as we saw through the pandemic, are focusing on out of these big city areas. So just something to keep in mind. I don't know if that's necessarily a risk, but just an interesting data point to recognize well, where the majority of the money is being spent. Well, it is, a, it is a risk because if anything happens inside of Toronto and Vancouver, it could sharply change the direction of the market, right? Anytime you've got you know, that kind of, if you will, leverage or that, that kind of uh, position in any market, um, 40%. I mean, if, if, you know, things taper off or things get quiet in either Toronto or Vancouver, the rest of the market will definitely feel it. Um, so if you're an investor, you're looking at your real estate, or even if you're just a homeowner and wondering about, you know, wondering about your place, typically, you know, look to Toronto first. That's our biggest market, right? Vancouver often trends right behind, uh, Toronto, but do note that if either Toronto or Vancouver really start to slide in terms of performance, the rest of the country is going with it. Yeah, great point. I think too, we hear a lot that Vancouver home prices have been detached from reality. And in reality <laughs> being, you know, um, average income to home price, for example, that's a, a great metric. And we can also look to the States for an interesting metric where up until about the year 2005, both the US and Canada were relatively on par for equivalent home prices in and around $280,000 was their average home in each country in respective currencies. Mm -hmm. But since then, since the last 16 years, that 280 jumped to about 380,000 for home in the States, whereas Canada is up to 700,000. Woo. Now I know I just said 770,000, but this data is from a couple of years ago. So it's up to the late 2000s here. So again, but you can see the disparity, disparity, excuse me, 380 to 700. It's they've completely detached from each other. You know, I mean, you've seen Canada absolutely spike. Mm -hmm. Well, and to that point, I mean, we, that then begs the question, you know, have wages increased by the same, same amount in Canada versus the US or have the wages increased by uh, a relative amount even just inside of Canada to make up for that? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, and that's why it's a risk, right? Um, I think the big thing to understand here too is, you know, on average, I don't know if many people know this, but on average since the 70s, like up into the 70s, 50s to the 70s is when you actually saw a significant amount of wage increasing. From the 70s to where we are on average, the average wage has gone up by 0.3% a year to give you some perspective, right? And now we're talking here of, uh, you know, in, in an average price point of let's call it 300,000 and now we're at 700,000. Um, you know, that's well over 100% right? And it's, it's huge by comparison. There's no way that the wages are, are keeping pace with assets. So um, that gets kind of scary when you think that prices relative to economic growth and personal incomes, Canada is now at 10 times per capita at the GDP, whereas the States is at two times, right? So that's a terrifying disparity. Um, because, be, because of our data on income, right? Mm -hmm. That's, it's exactly it. When it's, when it's that extreme difference that to me exposes vulnerabilities, I think too, uh, we can look at the, the average amount of disposable income rate growth compared to home prices. They've almost gone up verbatim. You know, they are almost matched. Where is in Canada house price growth rate, uh, is more than double that now of disposable income growth. So again, another disparity that shows that people are at the absolute extreme ends of affordability when it comes to how much they're paying on housing, which again, I guess is further accentuated here too. And uh, both BC and Ontario, which we know are where the most expensive homes are located, uh, mortgage payment in relation to pre-tax income 
is now up to 46 percent mm -hmm. that's that's a huge number and you know it's interesting too because <clears throat> you got to think there's some monetary policy at play there as well right i mean as these asset prices continue to go up and you continue to print more money the value of your money goes down and down so even if you do get a bump in your income call it ten thousand dollars a year you know if if you're if your currency is deflating by five to 10% a year, well, then you've just wiped out that gain altogether. Right. So it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about a bit again, about what is pushing up all these sales and right at the top of new mortgages are investors. So people that are buying their first investment property, second, third, fourth, whatever, they are responsible for the highest amount of new mortgages. Uh, right now it is at 24%. A quarter of all mortgages right now are going to investor investment properties. Uh, Pre-pandemic, this was about 22%. So, you know, not a radical change, but it is the highest ever and the current most that we are seeing across the board. Um, why is this? <laughs> Possibly because uh, about 18 months ago, when the QE started, Tiff Macklem said, hey, if you're thinking about taking out a big investment, we promise to keep rates low for the next two plus years. Mm-hmm. They said, go out and take big loans, take big mortgages, and we promise to keep payments low. He said it straight up. Yeah. And look, in, investors, for the most part, are talking about a lot of the things we talk about when they're making their decisions, right? They're looking at interest rates. They're looking at the cost of borrowing. They're looking at leverage. They're looking at demand cycles. They're looking at all, all of these things. And when you have monetary policy that drops to the basement, you know, um, you can't blame people for taking advantage, especially when you're asking them to inject money into the economy. Um, the problem is, as a lot of the money going into the economy isn't producing jobs or anything like that. So it's going into assets, which isn't going right back into the economy. But you can't come out and, and uh, you know, we can't have articles coming out a couple of days ago on Bloomberg saying now the central bank is blaming, um, you know, investors as a result of high prices. They've driven the price up. Well, you went and said, do that. And then you gave them the tool to do it. And now you're blaming them. It's, it's just poor monetary policy. It's, like, it's, just, it's just ludicrous. They're just yeah. deflecting. You yeah. created a problem. You said, do this. And now they did that. And now you're saying, oh, it's their fault. <laughs> it's <laughs> well, you, so gross. And it just goes to show how, I don't even want to say yeah, corrupt. But just so, yeah. Yeah. Deflecting the blame for people doing exactly what you told them to do. Yeah, you know, it's gross. Um, I don't like it. Yeah, and it's a narrative that the media will often play, right? So, um, anyhow, you know, it just picks a bone with us because it's, anyways, it's always the investors are always the ones that are hated on, and they're usually the ones providing the opportunities, providing the housing for rentals, providing, uh, yeah, anyways. <laughs> the, the partners in the business. <laughs> right. So well, let's do say if in the last year or so that yeah. a lot of these investors are first timers and they are buying their first investment property. And if they're doing it without enough knowledge or with a proper advisor guiding them, there's going to be some potential risks there. Big time. Right. We're going to see if we see the uh, interest rates rise and suddenly maybe they're cash negative on some properties maybe they can't carry them anymore you yeah. know you're going to see uh, an influx of those type of properties hit the market if that scenario does but, come to fruition but do remember i mean insolvency rates are at their lowest they've ever been oh yeah right? no i'm aware like that's just it right now you know we've never been as canadians more cash rich and you know less insolvent across yes. the board but yeah. it is it is at that tip the peak of that cycle it feels like correct and so we are just trying to get people ahead of what's potentially coming next um, by just providing this type of information so that you can uh, position yourself strategically. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyhow, so housing starts have now dropped for five months in a row. Uh, they're down 5.3% just last month in single family starts are down a whopping 30% since Q1 we also know that this housing type is going the way of the dodo bird. Um, unfortunately, that dream of owning a single family home is becoming very difficult, especially in places like Vancouver and Toronto. Um, 
Ryan, did you share your story about that Trout Lake property last week? <laughs> Even if you did, share it again quickly, just to give an example of demand on that type of property. Right yeah, now. I don't think I did. Um, so yeah, we've got a client um, very interested in this property. Actually, everyone was interested in this property. Uh, 1,226 square feet. Um, it's a laneway home, an infill home. So it's off the back of a main home, right? Um, no garage, uh, no parking, um, okay storage. Uh, had an active leak in the bathroom, <laughs> Um, anyhow, it wasn't perfect. It was built in the late nineties. Um, yeah, I had 11 offers. It was listed at 1.4 million, right? So already listed at 1100 plus a square foot. Uh, it had received 11 offers at 1.4 million. Um, we came second. I told my clients to back out cause it was getting too expensive. Um, and it sold for 1.695. Uh, nearly uh, $1,389 a square foot for bog land in Phil home in Trout Lake. Yeah. With um, 11, with 11 people trying to buy it. Right. So there's still 10 people out there. Average. I would assume the average bid was probably one five for a home like that. Right. So many guys, millions of dollars still floating around trying to find homes. Yeah, we had a, a colleague as well with a listing in Vancouver East, and it was basically a Vancouver special, um, listed for 1.4, 76 showings. Oh, sorry, I should I should reiterate, this is an original condition. Yeah, yeah, this is a tear, tear down. Yeah, um, 76 <laughs> showings in the one week that it was on the market, they held offers. On the Monday, they received 25 offers for a tear down. And uh, it sold for about four hundred and fifty thousand over ask, about yeah. one eight five. So these are these are this is the demand today in late November for detached homes in Vancouver. Yeah, it's and they're not building them. Crazy. And they are tearing them down and building more condos. So, again, we talk about it a fair amount, but that is what Ryan means by you know these detached properties are going the way of the dodo bird. There are less and less every single month here yeah, in, uh, in Canada very, very scarce asset in, in Vancouver now, and they have tremendous value as a result of their scarcity. Right. Um, and that's just unfortunate fact of low inventory, very cheap money, inflation, all of that. Right. Completed and unsold homes hit a fresh new low of only 8,500 units nationally. So that means, uh, homes that have just finished, they are ready to be lived in and they aren't sold. They're down from about 18,000 of them available oh. five years ago to 8,500 today. So our new, our new supply can't match the demand. Yeah. It's just dwindling. It's dwindling and dwindling. And this one's, this one's really interesting too. So rentals construction, okay? Purpose-built rental construction. Uh, the amount of homes under construction dedicated for renters just overtook the, the amount of homes being built, sorry, condos being built for end users for the first time in 30 years. So there's <laughs> more purpose rentals being built in condos. Um, so we talk about all time low inventory. A lot of people are building for renters, which, you know, when it comes to home ownership is building a type of property that is in less demand right now. And also it doesn't help the supply issues at all. It doesn't address any of those supply issues for people that are looking to buy a home. Yeah, there's, there's over 100,000 rental units under construction today in Canada. And that's the highest amount it's been in 30 years. So think about that for a second. If so you're in, some... I mean, it's been tracked for 30 years. It's not like it hit that high 30 years ago. Right, right. The number's right, been yeah. tracked for 30 years and it's an all-time high. So, I guess. So, so think about that. You know, home ownership, right, as an investment, you're looking at 100,000 new rental units coming on. Who owns those rental units? Probably a developer or it could be the government, right? So the government is investing a huge amount in their own real estate because they see it as a huge asset for the future. You should too. Yeah. And further to that point to this 100,000 that we're talking about, that's up from 20,000 10 years ago. So where do they think the market's going, right? Less and less inventory available. If they want to have any stake in asset growth in the future, they have to own the property, right? So if you're smart, you want to be smart with your money. You don't want to, you know, in Canada, when you've got 76% of homeowners, 76% uh, of the population, sorry, that own their home, 
um, you know, you need to take advantage of the system that's at, at play here, right? If you can. Yeah, and, and I think part of what may be driving the developers to this are, are numbers like this, where Toronto rentals just actually saw all time high <laughs> again <laughs> uh, in Q3. 56,000 units were rented in Toronto in Q3 Whoa. this year, um, up from 35,000 a year ago. Cow. And they're saying this is largely due to the amount of international student admissions, which just crossed 210,000 this year. It's just the students. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, you know, with that said, though, the, the list to lease ratio, so that's kind of like listing to sales, um, it's still lower than the pre-pandemic levels, sitting wow. around 50% today. Wow. Um, it uh, just over what, about two, three years ago, that was up at around 65%. And this just falls further in line with uh, the immigration targets, right? Although they're obviously not talking to anybody in housing. Um, <laughs> Because immigration is on track to hit its target of 401,000. Um, that's 45,000 new permanent residences in September. And that's the highest since 1913. We are, we've got more people coming to Canada now than in the post-war era. That's crazy. Keynote. Um, that most of these people already live in Canada. They're just now waiting on their PRs, right? And we've, we've known that for a long time. Um, however, um, you know, the working age population growth is still lower than pre-pandemic levels, 18,000 versus 26,000. Um, and the rate of new mortgages is slowing, right? Um, the slowest reading I think we've seen in seven months. Um, and that's roughly falling back in line with pre-pandemic levels. It's a little piece of good news. <laughs> yeah. and, and part of that may be because those rates are increasing. Yeah. You know, we've seen yeah. fixed rates up 90 basis points now to 2.4%, where variable is still rock bottom, 1.29% uh, range. Um, keeping in mind that with the, our current inflation rate, that puts the real rate at about a minus 3%, <laughs> being paid 3% to borrow money. Mm -hmm. um, but that's but going it, away. That's going away. It is. Yeah. And again, with rates rising, we are seeing a bit of a slowdown in the amount of people obtaining new mortgages. Um, on top of that too, right? We've got, you know, the, the government support systems are, are coming to an end, right? The, the pandemic support that was out there, the free money, the helicopter money, that's starting to slow. Uh, or some, some of the benefits, of course, have now ended. In September, we saw about 1.3 million Canadians still receiving some form of government benefits or assistance, uh, but that's down 187,000 from the month before. So that will slow the kind of excess funds that people have to do things like pay down credit cards or go shopping or stimulate the economy. And I think that was represented perfectly where we saw insolvencies while yes, at a record low, it basically flatlined from month to month from, from uh, September to October. Again, another indicator that we're kind of right at the peak of a cycle here. There's just, there's a lot of data pointing towards things are about to turn. Yeah. And one of the biggest ones being your bond yields, right? Um, you know, though we are about to transition with curve ending um, and inflation running high, bond yields have hit a two-year high of 1.6%. Um, and that's uh, further adding pressure to the BOC to add or raise rates, right? So um, it will be really interesting to see though, if, you know, we've got new new COVID variants coming out right now. I mean, we just saw that in the markets today, you know, they're all, all down on news of uh, a new variant. So again, you know, cycle one thing <laughs> this year is kind of unlike anything else. So we'll see where it goes from here. Um, and just lastly, you know, wanted to touch on this uh, article that we talked about earlier about Bloomberg coming out and saying, you know, the Bank of Canada says uh, invest, this is the headline, Bank of Canada says investor rush into housing risks correction. And basically, uh, you know, they're quoted here as saying a sudden influx, a sudden influx, even though they told them to go and do it, um, of housing, sorry, of investors in the housing market likely contributed to the rapid price increases we saw earlier this year. That can expose the market to a higher chance of correction. Well, so can giving away helicopter money and 
um, not incentivizing people to go back to work and uh, <clears throat> base, you know, negative interest rates that are being guised to something else, right? There's, there's worrisome developments that are taking place. And I get that. Um, but don't blame the investors when you gave them the tools and encouraged them to go and do it when you asked for investment. That's my piece with it. Just say, hey, look, the monetary policy is running out. We've got to change what we're doing. It's just a reality. But why are we keep blaming it on people? I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I just pulled up the clip here. It was July 15th of 2020, where Tiff Macklem, verbatim, if you've got a mortgage or if you're considering to make a major purchase or your business and you're considering making an investment, you can be confident that interest rates will be low for a long time. Yeah. Of course, if you are telling the public that, they're going to, well, ideally take your word for it and well, do exactly that. And they did. How can you turn it around and say, you are bad for doing what we told you to do? A lot of, a lot of investors too work on the inferences that come out of his mouth, right? Like he won't exactly say what they're going to do, but he will use certain terms, certain, you know, aggressive language, soft language, defensive language, all that kind of stuff. And investors read into that. When that came out, that was an incredibly aggressive thing to say as the head of the Bank of Canada. And now to come out, you know, and start blaming, well, well you guys went too hot. So, well, did, did we? Or did you go too low on your rates? And you drove asset prices through the roof. And you want to blame us? <laughs> I don't know. I don't like everybody's it. fault, but theirs. Hey. Yeah, I don't like it. It's the same old. It's funny because we're coming on here about a broken record. And talking about how it's always going up, all-time highs, all-time highs. Well, the Bank of Canada is also a broken record. You know, saying one thing and doing another, or doing one thing and then saying another. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, big one for us today. Thank you so much, as always, for watching and listening. Next week, we are back with what looks to be the November numbers. And in Vancouver, guess what? It's going to be a new all-time high in prices. Uh, that's just where it's pointing to. Oh, and it'll be a new all-time low in inventory for the month of November. So the record continues. Uh, we haven't hit stop yet. You know, We're not soon. on side B. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hey, please do uh, subscribe if you're enjoying these. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks.